fact, uh, you've published uh, this piece online and it starts out with this. I've been around for a long time and involved in some terrible campaigns, but the policy vacuum in 2013 was the worst I can recall. There was no serious debate on issues, whether simple or complex, and an obvious emphasis on personalities, stunts and trivia. So it doesn't get any worse than this, according to you. No, I think it was a very, very bad campaign. And it, it was perhaps a bit better in the last week, but on the whole, it was a very bad campaign. And you're saying on both sides? I think it was bad on both sides, but it reflects, I think, uh, the breakdown of the parliament, that the, the hung parliament, in fact, as I've said on this program several times, actually delivered in terms of its legislative achievement. But there was a relentless negativity all the way through. And it's obviously an effective, it's an effective way to do it. Um, you know, I've often quoted, uh, you know, what Lindsay Tanner said that when he came in, that that was the high point of rationalism in Australian politics. Now the appeal is to populism and populism pays off and it works. How concerning was it to you that, in your words, the campaign was hijacked by personalities, stunts and trivia? I thought it was just absolutely dreadful because, you know, every day you'd, you'd think, who's going to put a hard hat on today? Who's going to have a fluorescent jacket? Who's going to go and, uh, and be, be observing some process going on in a factory? Why they think this will change people's voting to say, until I saw Kevin Rudd in a hard hat, I decided to vote in another way. It's ridiculous. But there's always elements of that in a federal election campaign. I don't know always. Do you, could you imagine Robert Gordon Menzies going around <laughs> wearing a hard hat? But see, that was the days before TV, TV, extensive TV news coverage. Well, go back to the time of Whitlam. There was extensive television coverage there. Whitlam was never involved in stunts. Never. So how much blame do you put at the feet of us, the media? Oh, look, the, 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 the politicians are consenting adults. They say, oh, there's a photo opportunity. You can go out somewhere or other and, and get somebody going to a small business and saying, oh, this, this humanises the candidate. But in fact, how little time was, was devoted in really teasing out issues in saying there are two alternative views of the world. There are two intellectual constructs that need to be argued out. Why do you think that the two parties don't do that anymore? Because even though there has been, you could argue, over the last 20 years, a move to the centre, really, of both parties, they still are distinctly different ideologically. Why do you think neither camp really wants to argue those distinct ideological differences now? I think that there's a lot to be said in that, uh, what Alistair Campbell used to say in, in, with the Blair government, mm. to say that the the nature of the news cycle means you need three news stories every day. So it's not a matter of getting a single story, say, like the issue of climate change and what Australia can do about it. That might be something that takes months to do. People say, look, we talked about that yesterday. We had 30 seconds on that. Yeah. We've got to work out something that's absolutely new. Let's find some funny kind of geeky thing that will attract attention. How do you change the, that, though, as, as we look forward to the next election, the election after that, or indeed uh, political debate in this next parliament? Well, of course, we're going to have a new speaker who will have a completely different approach in the politics, we hope. Let, let's, let's just see. Um, I, I think, first of all, I think both parties have got to reflect on their performance, uh, not just in terms of winning seats, but how far they're redefining the Australian political culture. I mean... I'm sure there must be a lot of people in the Liberal Party today who reflect on this very blokey kind of culture that's coming out. It's not an accident that there's only one uh, female in the, in the Cabinet. And what it reflects is a very paternalistic, very conservative view. And I mean, I feel some sympathy. I don't want to sound hypocritical about this, but I feel some sympathy. If you think during the campaign, the way in which Tony Abbott's family was wheeled out from time to time, almost as if they were props, almost in a token way. I think that was appalling for them. I mean, Sarah, I, we saw a fair bit of the Rudd family as well, to be fair. Not perhaps quite to the same extent, but I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I'd accept the criticism on both sides. 
Well, indeed, turning to your side, you write in your piece, the coup, the coup um, uh, against uh, Julia yeah. Gillard was a central factor, and against Kevin Rudd, was a central factor in the decay of civilised discourse on policy issues, undermining of trust in people and the unleashing of non-stop attacks in media outlets. So you still see that the, the fundamental problem on your side of politics as having been the way that Kevin Rudd was, was tipped out and then, I guess, in turn, the way that Julia Gillard was too. I, I think part of the problem always is, is is to say, we've got to do it now, in the next half hour. We can't wait. Uh, it, by sheer coincidence, I happened to be in Parliament House on the night of the coup, and uh, I was struck by that there's a combination of, of panic, panic over the reaction of what had happened about the mining tax, mm -hmm. uh, and fear, and excitement, and there were people to whom it was a, a, a kind of a game. Mm. But the worst of all was to say, look, this is not an not an area we can we can sit back and think about and maybe come back and revisit it next week. Say it's got to be done now. It can't wait. It's got to be done in the next few minutes. And that that's a, so it's a that's madness. Leadership into, by panic. Yeah. You, you're calling for voting reform, really, in, in this piece, or at least pointing out that the real problems, the voting anomalies, the fact that the, that the Labor Party got high primary votes in some states and yet nonetheless only secured one Senate seat and the like, and the rise of the micro-parties. What would you like to see done? Look, I think there will be, because of the weird result in the Senate, and because of some of those micro parties, uh, particularly the, the you know the the odd results in Western Australia and in Victoria, and in and in South Australia, I think you're going to find that both major political parties will have perhaps uh, a modification of the above the line system, right? Uh, and that perhaps where you only have to vote for ten candidates or twelve candidates, something like that, that would encourage more people to have a considered vote, to work their way through and to follow the how-to-vote cards of the of the major political parties. Yes, you might even get some bipartisan support on that one. I don't know if you look very <laughs> carefully. It, it, you get a very great revelation on the ABC election site yeah. about the actual preferential count and to say that you've got the 44th count in Victoria yeah. and, and the, the animal rights, the animal justice preferences go through to the motoring enthusiasts yes, and yes. so on. And you think, what is that all about? Yeah, no, it seems like things are going to change in that run, on uh, that front. Yeah, just qu quickly going back to the new cabinet, how concerned are you as a former science minister there isn't a distinct science minister? In the Outraged. Council? I haven't decided to leave the country yet, but it, it's, <laughs> I've, I've got to contemplate. Look. This is, reflects the fact we've stopped talking about science, we've stopped using scientific method, we've stopped using analytical method, we've stopped using the principle that was established, well, in the time of the Enlightenment of the 18th century, about even an issue like, say, say asylum seekers. We don't evaluate the evidence to say, let's look at the statistics, let's look at the comparative international position, let's r recognise that Australia ranks number 47 in the world in the number of, in the number of asylum seekers, number 47. You didn't hear that figure quoted during the election campaign. We, our time is tight, so we have to let you go in a moment, but just one quick... Well, I have to come back. <laughs> you probably will. One well, no, quick last question before we let you go. Do you think this new selection process for a Labor leader will heal some of the wounds on that side of politics? Absolutely. I think it'll be very well handled. I think I'm looking forward to uh, playing uh, uh, some role as a, as a, as a, branch, uh, as a branch member. Uh, both candidates... Uh, have got a lot to give. Both candidates respect each other mm -hmm. and both candidates are devoted to working within that new system. I think it's a terrific change. Very